Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Kraus. Our guest today is Yakir Yaniv. Yakir is the CEO of EDNU, which is a leading human factors company in Israel. Yakir is also the recently elected chairperson of the Israeli Human Factors and Ergonomics Association of just this year. Welcome to the pod, Yakir. Hi, Spencer. Nice to be with you. Good to have you here. So we just met last week, and already I feel like I know you, and uh, I, I am really excited to be talking to you because you're clearly not a dumb guy. So. Thanks. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's a good starter. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, so you had your background in systems engineering before you went the human factors route, too. That's and then right. you tell me just before we get started for people listening for context, um, EDNU's got just now 15 employees, which is pretty awesome. I mean, that's right. a... It's a right. decent sized crew to have saturated. So, and then some of the work you've done that I remember is, you know, the military stuff. Um, and then, I don't know, what are, what are some of the projects you've done that you can talk about? I guess I want to make sure I'm, I'm careful here. I know it's mostly just stuff yeah. that's on the website, but still. That, that's, that's great. Um, well, basically um, we're, act, we're active in, in several uh, industries. Uh, defense industry is one of them but uh, we're very strong in medical devices industry and in industrial machineries like uh, printing presses and uh, other production machines also working environment uh, but we work uh, with startups who uh, develop uh, SaaS programs uh, or SaaS uh, systems um, that are, um, you know, that's that's only digital, only only um, uh, only software. Uh, actually, everything that has to do uh, of interaction between people and systems, services, products, you can find us there. Sweet, yeah, that's really awesome. <laughs> What's your favorite industry? <laughs> my favorite, yeah. uh, my favorite, medical, me medical. Uh, Mine too medical services and medical uh, devices because um in every project that you do in the medical area you feel that you're changing the world a little bit that you're solving somebody's pain but but real physical pain uh that you that you um ease a little bit of the stress that uh medical crews or medical teams uh suffer during their day because you know it's very stressful work at, yeah. let's say in a hospital or in an or um so 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 this is this is uh very fulfilling very satisfying to uh to understand that you did something that uh made the world a little better i completely agree um that's the exact way I feel whenever I work on a medical project. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah uh, to quote my one friend, uh, Dimitri, who has a women's work boots company, you feel like not a douche working on these sorts of things. <laughs> 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 yeah. But, um, yeah, I, um, I guess that's really interesting. What are some of the medical applications you've worked on that you're kind of particularly proud of? I remember the, um, well, I, I'll let you talk about it. I don't want to. Yeah, we, we worked with, with uh, actually, we, 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 because um, we have uh, a quite professional team and uh, most of us uh, have many years of experience in the industry, uh, we get to work with, uh, with big companies, corporates um, that produce uh, either uh, devices for, uh, to, to that, you know, to to perform very um, complex medical uh, operations or medical um, uh, uh, medical uh, procedures, like uh, that REM X-ray machine that has a, a very unique way of getting an image of your body from different sizes, which is a really breakthrough, and, and we were uh, escorting them on their way to get an FDA approval. Oh, cool. We we had we had a partner and together we, we did uh, the, the approval. There is, when you, when you go to an FDA approval, uh, aside from the clinical um, tests that you have to run, there is an aspect of human factor study or usability study where the FDA wants to make sure that the people who are going to operate this uh, device 
are doing it correctly according to the design intent and it is safe for them and safe for the patient to use it but not in the meaning of whether the um, uh, the procedure will not be efficient effective or in the meaning that if it's um uh, if it's a harmful medicine or device but by the way that you operate it will you make a mistake will somebody uh miss understand what's written on the um, on the monitor and misinterpret it uh, and and will do and will take a, a wrong a wrong step so this is what we do we we test it, it is called usability testing nice. we test how people are operating regardless of how effective the procedure is actually when we're doing the test it's using the real machine but without the procedure so if it's an x-ray machine it will not radiate the, the so-called patient. If it's an um, insulin pump, uh, we will do everything but putting the insulin really to the body, just to see people how they operate it. And we try to do it in, a, um, in an environment that simulates the real use environment, like an OR or domestic or just any other relevant environment and by the people who are really going to use it. So if it's a domestic, you will bring people with the actual disease that need to use it. If it's in, in a hospital, you'll bring uh, the specific uh, physicians who are going to operate the, the equipment. Awesome. So, so this was one thing. And there's uh, this company who um, develops um, a system that navigates through the lungs and, and locate and, and take um, biopsies from lung cancer. And over there, it was very interesting because you have to, um, you have, you have to uh, analyze many aspects of human factors, like the ergonomics, how the physician actually standing in the OR and how they're, uh, how they're holding the equipment what they see on on the monitor and how they interpret it and transform it to actions that they take. How, how do you um, emulate a lung biopsy from the physician's perspective without actually going into a patient's lungs? Is that just graphics or? So, um, so actually um, what they have is a model, a plastics model of lungs and you can navigate cool. through the uh, through the tubes. That's great. So that's almost cool. like uh, like 1960s NASA, like moon landing practice where they just had a camera. <laughs> that's, that's you, know, awesome. you know, you know what? What my, my analogy was? Do you remember uh, the movie uh, Inner Space with um, with Dennis Quaid, where they shrink him and, and he starts and, and he navigates through in, inside the body with his uh, a miniature. I don't want to watch that now. I've not spaceship. seen it yet. <laughs> You should, you should. Inner space. Oh, it's, it's, I gotta, okay, I gotta see that. Inner space. It's from the from the eighties, I think, and he navigates through the through the through the body uh, tubes and through the blood tubes and, and all the organs. So this is how you feel, <clears throat> is you actually go inside with a catheter that has a camera inside, but but then there is this digital model on the monitor of the of of the real uh, of the real lines of the patient. Uh, where you can see where you're at. So this company uh, uh, developed it many years ago. They they they, they have a, a long tradition of, of development. This is this this product is already on the market. But when they wanted to make changes in the ergonomics, uh, so the um, the physicians will have uh, an easier holding of the equipment uh, in the navigation, understanding of uh, what they see and how to design the controller in order to uh, for them to understand better and transform what they see into an action so this is where they called us and luckily what's unique in our uh, in our team that it consists of all aspects of human factors uh, like ergonomics yeah. like we said but also we have uh, cognitive psychologists and human factors cool. engineers and UX UI designers. Sweet. So we can uh, we do this integration um, within one uh, one uh, one team. So we can deliver just 
just any solution to, to, to a problem that incorporates human interaction. That's awesome. Do you usually handle the engineering perspective yourself or do you have other engineers on staff that give that, um, give that, that as well that, for that, the technical side? Well, I, I come, um, as you said in the beginning already, I, I come from, I, my, uh, my bachelor's degree is in, uh, is in mechanical engineering and, and I did my graduate in industrial design, nice. majoring, in, majoring in human factors. So, so I know engineering. But, but uh, at one point in my career, I decided to focus on humans rather than on the machines. Yeah. So in my team, there are no engineers. There are people with engineering background. Nice. But usually because we are um, working alongside with engineering teams, if it's the customer, usually the customer teams, uh, so we know how to talk to them in the engineering language, so-called. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, it can be it can be a mechanical engineer or a software engineer or uh, an electrical engineer. We we know uh, how to uh, give them the human factor requirements that they can implement later in their design, and then we can work with them on dilemmas that they have when they cannot fulfill completely the requirement that we give. So we, we yeah. know the trade off. Well, that's that's what I was kind of getting at without saying it is in my limited experience, whenever I've worked with the design team on a technical project, you're I guess when you're idealizing your design, sometimes you come up against technical feasibility or, you know, and, and that's it or, or budget constraints yeah, right. or certain things. And so it helps to have an engineer in the room, at least for the conversation. But, you know, I mean, I think your team sounds like it's way better stacked for, you know, serious yeah, but, UI, but, UX. But, but it, goes, it goes the other way around as yeah. well, because uh, sometimes uh, my, uh, people from my team uh, come to me and, and say, well, I, I cannot give the, the, I gave them the requirement, they cannot implement it. I don't know what to do now. And then I and then I tell them, okay, so give um, the nearest, uh, the, the closest uh, requirement that you can give. So they implement it, and, but they say, but then it's not optimal. I say, so we have two options. Either you give you give what uh, what you think is close enough, or you let the engineer choose uh, <laughs> what, what what number they will take um, with without their experience in, in in human in human interaction. What, so what do you prefer? <laughs> and, and of course they say, okay, okay, I'll give the number. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So when someone comes to you, like, I, I guess I'm kind of glomming on to the lung biopsy project just because it sounds really interesting to me. But do you do a user study first on the existing product to find sort of gaps or opportunities and just see how the physician interacts with it before you start redesigning it and then do iterative user studies? Or is it, what does that process look like, I guess? Like, what do you, what do you do in what order? So, 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 so actually, uh, you touched the, the specific point because in order to understand how people are going to use something or what are the limitations in, in using something, you have to know the people. So we always start with a user study or a user research. And, and, and the, the user research is, is consists of understanding who the users are uh, in terms of uh, population, where, where they come from, uh, what what are their skills and limitations, but it goes down to uh, did they use this system before? And because we usually work with complex systems rather than uh, uh, consumer goods or consumer products, uh, we will always work with people who are uh, experts in their fields. So uh, the products that or the systems that we work on are never uh, out of the box products, okay? Usually yeah. people need to go uh, to, to take a course uh, as short as possible uh, in order to operate it. But uh, so we need to know what they learned, uh, what they're used to, what did the old uh, product look like. And then we analyze, we do what, what's called task analysis, meaning uh, we take what was the intent of the design, uh, how to operate, and then we say, okay, now you said they need to, uh, to, to press this button, and now they need to turn on the machine, and now they need to, uh, 
to put in, I don't know, to put in some part. And then we say, oh, but here um, there's something that happens now. That now there's a gap. I see there was a gap. How did you imagine people will do it? And and this this is what we do. We, when we do task analysis, we consider how people perceive the environment during our sen uh, through our senses, how the um, um, uh, how they process the information, and then how they take decisions and take actions, and what feedbacks they need. So there, there, there's a whole uh, methodology around it. And that's on the tail uh, end we, of the initial user study or um, user just, analysis. Just, okay. Well, well, when when after I, I understand uh, what who the people are, that are going to use, then then I then I um, I try to kind of combine the two things, taking the the engineers' uh, intent taking the users uh, that are going to use it. And now I'm doing the analysis, the task analysis of how these people are going to operate this equipment and, and finding the gaps, but also cool. uh, considering uh, cognitive, uh, the cognitive burden of, of people. Of, uh, is, it, is it too stressful? Uh, are, is there too much information here? Uh, are they expected to do uh, uh, very complex things that may then lead to to mistakes, and after that, then you try start to conceptualize the the interface, and you go down until the design. Okay, so even if you're not starting from a clean sheet in terms of oh. your design, like there's a pre-existing product, you still want to sort of get away from that and see if you could come up with a better UX, given yeah. that you know maybe there's a better way. Like even if this person's used you know okay. surgery robot X for you know five years. Maybe they could, I don't know. I feel like in the one hand, and I'm just trying to put myself in your position, their, um, their perception of what a robotic surgery should be like might be constrained by their experiences with robotic surgery, surgery robot X, where right. robot surgery, so robotic surgery robot, sorry, surgery robot Y doesn't exist yet. But I don't know. Do you find you have to like retrain people? Is that a challenge? Do you try to, do you sometimes make design decisions just based on the status quo? because it's what people know already and you don't want to go against that. Well, there, there's a synergy of what, of the expertise people have in their field. Like if uh, these people are um, developing surgery robots, so, uh, and, and we come with our understanding of humans, but also because we are a project company we see different industries and we see different uh, ideas and we're exposed to different technologies that uh, you, you were right. Usually people uh, in that, that uh, work a long time in, in a specific industry in a specific company, they have this, uh, their organization's tradition of how to do things. And sometimes it's hard for them to open their mind to new ideas. So that's where we come from. But we also use sometimes uh, methodologies of design thinking workshops or um, scenario workshops that we run with the people inside the company. And, and, and usually the ideas, uh, well, we, we, we don't bring, uh, we don't own the innovation for our customers. Usually they come with what they want to do. And, and, and you know, sometimes I, I, I hear it as a complaint when people tell me, Okay, but so why did we take you for? We came with all the bright ideas. Uh, our engineers came with them. I said, that's right, because you know you know this field. You're the experts in uh, in this matter, and we are here to help you uh, implement it in your product, and uh, and help you make it okay. What we actually do is take um, complex systems and make them easy to use. Nice. That, that, that this is our work okay and, and and this is and this is what my kids also say when they when they're asked what what your dad is doing <laughs> at work so when i worked with you at Packard, they said my my, fa my father is building uh, is designing uh, printing presses and now they're saying uh my father is making machines uh easy easy to use so th that this this is my work <laughs> nice uh, so so it's 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 uh, not necessarily that we come with the innovative ideas, but we help uh, we help the innovation teams of our customers to implement their ideas in a way that people will be able to use. 
but that makes a lot of sense to me. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So, so I guess, how did you end up here, right? You've got a background in mechanical engineering and industrial design. Um, what, what made you decide to go, uh, go toward human factors on complex systems? I mean, that's, it's a pretty awesome field, but it's also a pretty niche field. Mm -hmm. I feel like there, there must've been yeah. a journey there. Well, uh, as I mentioned, I, I worked, uh, I worked, I started as a mechanical engineer uh, uh, first in the plastics in industry, but then it, it fueled the record for many years, uh, moving from mechanical engineering to system engineering. And I was responsible for uh, the, actually the technical integration of, of very complex systems. And um, time after time, I, I said to myself, well, we're doing something wrong here because um, I don't know if you know, but in mechanical engineering school they don't teach you how to build machines they teach you how to design parts and and what they never tell you is that there's a human on the other side that has to use these things uh, <laughs> well, there's so, also so a human that has to assemble it and there's a human that has to right, service it right right <laughs> actually actually yeah. actually there's, there's a name for that, that that's human system integration that that's another field that um, um uh, that that we're active in but but nice. basically um, so, so I, I started to look at how people are going to use the thing that I designed and because I went to support some customers and I heard the complaints and, and the pains that they were expressing about the design of our machines. And I said, okay, then I started to, to look at it and, and then I was, um, I, I was starting to read about it and, and to learn and, and. I had a colleague at work also who, who looked at it from the software uh, part of things, meaning UX, um, and which which wasn't on my on, on my past at all at that time. Um, and, and then and then I came to the um, to the decision of what I want to uh, to take for graduate, and I tried to apply uh, to MBA program. Um, I've thought about that myself. At at Carnegie Mellon. Nice. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, and I got until the waiting list, and I wasn't accepted. Ah, so I said, okay. So I said, what am what am I doing now? So I went to design school, and and that was the best decision in my life because I I really find what I, what I'm passionate at. So so I took uh, I took this um, this this path and started to to study human factors and uh, with together with industrial design so i saw the combination of both together with my um still working as a system engineer at Hewlett packard so all the things combined together human factors and the design and my actual work and and then i i, I was lucky because Hewlett packard started to uh, work on a new uh, printing press platform and I was uh, one of the system engineers there, and, and my manager said, why won't you be responsible for the human factors? Uh, so we called it operability, maintainability, design. Uh, and, and I said, okay. So I, I became the, the system engineer who is responsible for all the human factors in this press. And, and, and I really uh, found something that, uh, you know, it was very interesting because the system was so complex. And one of you said it weighed eleven tons, uh, right? Eleven tons. That's yeah. wild. Eleven <laughs> tons. It's, it's a big it's, boy. Uh, in 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 meters or uh, in in feet, it's about uh, um, just a minute. No seven feet over seven feet over seven feet uh, cube. Seven cubic feet. Uh, so that would be like about seven. two meters. Two, two meters over, two meters over, two meters, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, it's, it's a huge machine. Uh, and, um, and, and, we had, and, and we had some uh, basic requirements for this. One of them was, they said, um, the Indigo division of Yule Pecker, this is the, the division that uh, manufactures these presses, uh, the Indigo division uh, machines usually require one week course to operate. And now we have this uh, huge press, which is much complex. It was it was about two times in every aspect of all the machines that we did before. Two times bigger, two times faster, two times uh, or twice uh, twice uh, harder to use. What so, about from like a moving said, parts perspective? Do you know like approximately 
they must have said like uh, there's X number of moving parts at some point. I feel like you get that with complicated I, I, things. I, I, I don't remember. I don't remember yeah. we counted them, but Fair actually, <laughs> uh, I, I, I can I can turn quiz we, we do one week about printing, but but actually there's there's one uh, one system that delivers the paper. Yeah. It's the paper handling system that takes the the, 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 the paper from the feeder to the stacker uh, and runs it through the through the press. And there's another system that is doing the imaging, uh, taking it from software, uh, converts it to uh, to a laser beam, and then uh, converts it to imaging. And there's the ink system who delivers the ink into the imaging <laughs> and then puts it on the paper. And it, it's it, I I. Um, I saw a lot of complex machines in my life since I left uh, HP. I never saw uh, uh, a system that is more complex than, than this present. So, so it was a great school. It was a great place to to to, and um, and and we had and we had some. I, I told you some requirements. Uh, one of them was that uh, you need to have one week course to operate it. You cannot have six months course. Uh, every uh, printing actions and um and basic maintainability should be uh should be done by a single person and uh, that it should fit people all around all over the world because hp uh sells from the far east to northern europe and the united states to south america and people in different sizes uh, yep. and different cultures different languages and and, and uh, and actually, we, uh, uh, we 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 fulfilled all the requirements. Well, the course wasn't one week; it was two weeks, <laughs> but it was okay. Nice. But it was okay. Two times so as many. But <laughs> yeah, but but when, when you put it when you put it up front as part of the set, and, and you're an engineer, so you know, as as part of the set of requirements for the machine, then you don't have to compromise down the road. But you take it into consideration in the first place, and you do the design according to this aspect as well, just like performance or um, or power consumption or uh, noise or, or just any any other requirement. That's awesome. Yeah, right. and, and then after um, after a few years, I, I went to. Uh, uh, the uh, VP R and D, and I told him, "Well, you know, I don't want to be a system engineer anymore. Uh, I want to be a human factors engineer." And he said, "Well, we don't have this position here." I said, "Okay, then." Then I quit and I opened my own <laughs> business, and, and, that's, and that's what happened. <laughs> that's awesome. By the way, they have now they have now a big uh, team of human factors. Nice. Do you still work with them yeah. at all? Uh, a little bit. A little bit, but uh, the printing industry in Israel is uh, um, is, is pretty big I mean, and, and interesting, and we work almost with all printing in, uh, printing uh, ma machines, manufacturers, and developers in Israel. So uh, my background in printing really helps me with some of the customers, and my background as an engineer helps me with all my customers because, as I said. Um, we talk the same language. Yeah. And yeah, no, I find it helps. Um, I mean, my dad's a surgeon, and so I, I kind of, and my granddad's a cardiologist, so I grew up around a lot of doctors. And I think early on getting some of, you know, the medical projects that SKA has worked on, it really helped just knowing how to talk to doctors and right. you know, sitting around the dinner table with these these people and realizing they're not that intimidating, you know, and um, also like here are their pain points, you know, here's some of their sense of humor. You know, like here's you know, the sort of ego I've seen on you know some of my family wow. members and that There's field. There's a lot of ego in the med in the medical industry. Oh, for a sure there is. Ego. Have you ever interacted with medical students though? Like I feel like it's hilarious because it's it's the same ego but no, less no, mature. Not really. And so I, I no, not really. When I when I was at Case Western Reserve University doing my undergrad before I transferred to the University of Pittsburgh, I made friends with uh, a medical student. My best friend for a while was a medical student, and so. Him and I were uh, were pretty close, and so I got invited to all these parties with medical students there, and it was like the most arrogant people, it, maybe except for the law students. They were pretty arrogant as well. Oh, but there's it's, another few, yeah, like, architects. Yeah, imagine imagine those personalities, but like 
just totally uncensored, unchecked, you know, like, like they just unfiltered, you know? So, you know, they, it was like all of the elitism with none of the accomplishment. <laughs> so wow. it was, was kind of, uh, that was my perception at the time. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. But I don't know. I mean, these days, like, I feel like my friends that are doctors are like pretty, pretty, I mean, they're my friends. I, I elect to spend time with them. You know, I, I, and, you know, I can hang, you know, and so that helps a lot when working on the medical projects because I'll be like, hey, Lauren, what do you think of this? And she'll be like, oh, well, if I were using it, you know, this is what I would want, you know, or I'll call up my dad and be like, hey, you know, dad, what do you think of this? And he's like, well, I don't know if you'd actually end up using that for these reasons, you know, <laughs> you know, so I don't know. It's kind of it's kind of helpful sometimes just to just to have buddies yeah. everywhere and and. I mean, I'm not a human I, factors engineer, but I still try to take, you know, I, I don't want to make stuff that's bad to use. And so right. at least Nobody informally, wants. I try to take it into account. And, and a lot of that came from reading Tom Kelly, uh, Tom Kelly, the CEO of IDEO or the general manager of IDEO uh, back in 2003-ish. He came out with this book called The Art of Innovation. And I read that when I was a kid and it made me just kind of think about it. I mean, I think they did a lot of consumer products, so it's different. And right. I tend to favor the sort of systems that ED and U works on at this point in my career because they're they're interesting and, and the users are interesting and they're I don't know it's just there's just a lot of fun you know engineering and design problems to solve in, in super complex you know involved systems and I don't know I I, I kind of envy <laughs> some of the stuff you get to work on because it, it just sounds well, like really, then really we fun should problems. we should do stuff to, stuff together and, you know ah, but, but really one. One one thing one thing that uh, I really uh, uh, I think I insist uh, with every new customer or every new engineer that I work with is that down the road when we finish our work together they look at things a bit different than what they looked before and they know they know a little bit more about human factors so they can take these considerations or this education to their next project. So we, I also will, I, I teach, I, I run courses, I give lectures, but also uh, when, when I work with people, I try to give them the rationale behind the things. I try to help them read the, read the standard as it should be read to give them the considerations. But also what I'm doing when I have the chance when somebody, when a mechanical engineer designs something or when a software engineer designs something, I ask them to operate what they designed. <laughs> and so, nice. so, they, they ex, so they experience um, uh, the difficulties or, or, or the same experience that their users is going to experience. Wow. And, and it gives them a sense of understanding of why it's important. That's that's clever and that's interesting, but I feel like there's an obvious caveat there, which is I can engineer a horrible to interact with system, but I at least know where I place different form elements and text that shouldn't be there and you know a, a menu right. within another menu where it probably shouldn't even exist and there should just be a button. I know where all that stuff is because I, I built it. And so right. when so, that person operates it, they're like, oh, obviously you go to this and then that and then this and then you open this exactly. and then you type the thing in and, you know, it made my popcorn, you know, <laughs> it worked. <laughs> obviously. You know? How do you get people out away from their own biases if, if they're the ones that, that put it together? Okay, so, so this is a great point because uh, the, the, the reason I give people to experience what they designed is that I want them to understand uh, a little bit of how uh, the users will um, will feel. But when we do usability testing, in order to validate the design, we don't bring people from inside the organization. Uh, we bring people, we, we try to get people who are not, we call it contaminated with, uh, with the development process. So, uh, so they, uh, as you said, they know where they hit, they hit things, uh, or they, they know how to uh, override uh, difficulties. So we we give we take people that from the population who's going to operate the system, and we give them tasks or scenarios, and we ask them to operate the system. And 
at this way uh, we get objective uh, perspective on the real use of the press or the machine or the uh, medical device and then we go and and then and then there, there's there's another way of the analysis well when people from the outside look at people who tried to operate something and um, and made a mistake or failed or something and they say okay so one person failed so what can you learn from this or okay so three people people failed or people uh, pre three people succeeded what can you learn uh, so they look at the raw material of what people did but what we do as human factors engineers or researchers we we uh try to understand what was the reason for the failure or to the, the mistake did they uh, not uh, understand what they saw did uh, they not understand what to do did uh, did they saw uh, the alarm that was uh, you know lighting in red over there did they saw did they see the message uh, did they understand how to operate this button and then we and then we uh, we analyze it and we say okay so uh, this mistake is probably a learnability issue meaning if they do it uh, another time they will remember it and we don't need to change anything here but do you run the mistake, same user through the system again to confirm that uh, we try okay we try uh, not well, well depends on the complexity of the system got it and depends on the uh, the duration of the development. We have systems that we uh, we work with their development for two years now or three years, and we bring we bring people uh, every every few months to try the system, and we try that at least part of the team that is trying are people who tried it before because we want to see. Uh, the, the if they remember and and how to compare them with, with the other team is that where uh, cognitive so, psychology so, comes into the discipline just out of curiosity cognitive psychology is the basics okay. of human factors engineering <laughs> and user experience it's it's the basic thing so you have to understand this is this is uh where everything starts from so actually in the past people who uh did UX design came from uh, cognitive psychology. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. And how does UX differ from human factors? Because I'm trying to differentiate them in my head, and it seems like yeah. human fact. Okay, I'll I'll let you talk. <laughs> no, no, no. I, it's interesting to 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 hear what you what you said. Ah, I'll tell you my misconceptions then. Yeah. So it, it <laughs> seems like uh, in my head, right? I'm thinking human factors seems to be like figuring out how people interact with machines. Um, but that also seems to be what UX is. But then I look at like something like ergonomics and is that a part of UX or not? And in my brain, you know, it's, it's like this microphone is a diameter where I, I might want to hold it or, you know, maybe the stand gets in the way. So maybe this isn't the most ergonomically designed stand for grabbing a microphone, but I don't know. That's, that's kind of where my brain goes is, is the physical sensation of manipulating an object is ergonomics. But that seems to be a subset of user experience because if I'm comfortable or uncomfortable, or if I have to adjust my body in a, in a bizarre way, um, you know, that affects my experience as a user. Um, but then all of this seems to fall under human factors as you're defining it. Uh, so I guess this is, this is my, you know, my wrong conception of, of what this stuff is. It, it is not totally wrong. You're in the right direction, but let me try to do some, to put some, to organize the terms. Sure. Well, we live in a hybrid world. Uh, which is digital and physical. Okay, uh, uh, every almost everything that we use, everything around us, uh, is both digital and physical. The, the, the things that we operate, the things that we use, um, especially uh, with with gadgets around us, but also things that we we uh, we meet at work like uh, machines like our, our car like the vending machine uh, on the street um so human factors relates to uh what are the factors of of the human so how are we built 
uh, how we understand things, how we process um, information, what are our cognitive limitations, but also physical limitations. You know, there, there's there's a funny, uh, a funny, funny thing to look at it because there there's a, a kind kind of a difference of how Americans and Europeans use it because in in, in the USA. Uh, uh, everything that's cognitive is called human factors engineering or human factors and everything that's physical is called ergonomics oh interesting and in, in, in europe in europe uh, is they they talk about physical ergonomics and cognitive ergonomics that's really so, interesting so they, they, and 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 i i had a, a teacher who said oh, well ergonomics is everything from the neck down and <laughs> cognitive uh, cognitive is everything that from the neck up so, <laughs> uh, by the american but, perception not by the european perception it sounds like yeah yeah <laughs> so uh so human factors and ergonomics are the the limitations and capabilities of the of the of the human okay uh, how uh, how, how fast is our processor and how strong it is but how strong and how strong and and fit is our body and muscle and musculoskeletal uh system and all the other stuff that we talked about are the applications of what we're doing so if you talked about this microphone it's a product so it it should be designed by taking into consideration the human factors that are relevant for this, meaning uh, how people will hold it, uh, how 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 close people should be, uh, how how much will be its weight, and UX is also <laughs> UX, UX is also the application of human factors into a digital product. So when I talk about user experience. It means I am designing. Uh, I am designing an uh, uh, an interface. Okay. Uh, so in a in a way that people can use it. But when I talk about user experience, it as I told you, it, it, it it's hybrid. Uh, my my user experience as a passenger in the train, my user experience um, as a worker in the factory, my user experience in the military as a as a tank commander. So, so uh, it it all comes together to to what the person uh, feels and doing and understands and, and frustrates. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, every so time you try to I... go through a door, you get smacked in the face. That's part of your user experience, I guess. <laughs> but Probably. it's the job of the ergonomics team to make sure that your face will clear the door before you have to experience that, I don't know. <laughs> okay, I and, think I'm starting and, to see the and, line here. And, and if you're a person who who's really uh, getting mad on these design mistakes, then you become a human factors engineer <laughs> because <laughs> you want to fix the world. <laughs> yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, um, I feel like it's, yeah. oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, no, no, yeah, that's good. I, I, yeah. It's interesting to look at sort of where the line is between, um, you know, user uh, ex design for user experience, or I guess human factors engineering are, are sort of similar if I talk about them that way, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but it's interesting to see where the line is drawn between that and systems engineering, um, I guess, in the more classical sense, because I guess there seems to be a bit of overlap, but... I mean, obviously not quite, and you've done both, so you're you're in a better position than most people to answer this question. I I think I think that it, if I wouldn't uh, have been a system engineer, I wouldn't have become a human factors engineer, because uh, in in a design team of a complex system, there are only two functions who look at the system as uh, as one um, as a one whole product. It's a system engineer and the human factors engineer, because you know all the others are like uh, subsystems uh, designers or subsystem teams, and, and they look at the specific subsystem that they're uh, that they're responsible for, uh, maybe to the neighboring uh, the uh, subsystem that they have to interface with. I mean, interface uh, engineering. Yep. Um, and and the system engineer has to see it is everything integrates into one 
uh, functional machine. Yep. And so, so the system engineer will look at all the connections between the subsystems and how everything uh, orchestrates together. And the human factors engineer, uh, I say, uh, what I say uh, to people, well, uh, I don't care how you built it. For me, it's a black box. Uh, I care only uh, <laughs> how, how people are interacting with it. Okay, I'm a person, I want to do something. Am I able to do what I wanted to do with this machine? Okay, so, so this is my job. Yeah. To, to make sure that people are able to uh, perform the tasks that uh, they uh, that they need. So the systems um, engineer might and, want to and, incorporate the work of the human factors engineer into their requirements, for instance. Exactly. But the human right, factors engineer. The, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, no, it, it's exactly what you said. The system engineer is responsible for uh, requirements management, and part of the requirements management is human factors uh, requirements. And if you take it into and and, and it's it's going uh, cross system, so uh, you have to put it uh, inside the procedures and methodology of how you design things. And we mentioned it before. It's it's a um, it's it's a whole um, area called HSI, human system integration, which basically um, is doing of uh, what uh, how. Am I incorporating all the human aspects into the design of the uh, of the of the of the system? And uh, so, so you'll find it in 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 the U.S. You'll find it as human system integration. In in U.K. You'll find it as human factors integration. But it's all the same thing. And it, it was it was uh, developed in NASA and in the military uh, because they understood that. If you want to uh, make uh, a system that will be uh, easy uh, to operate, but also easy to main maintain and easy to, but, but you know, you maybe using easy is not the right term, but it should fit the people who, who needs to operate it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so you need to take into consideration everything. And, and what I do in my work when, when I, um, uh, when I join a, a, a complex project, the first thing that I do is to develop um, a human system integration plan, which means what are the actions that we're going to take along the project plan in order to make sure that we are implementing human factors aspects the right way and that we check ourselves along the way uh and and usually we're measured on this nice. and we need to to prove and give and bring evidence to activities that we made and the results that we got and that we're going on the right plan and the intended users really will be able to operate this the equipment so what might some of the actions on that plan look like uh, just for example okay so we, we we start we we mentioned in, in the beginning we will start with uh with the user research and and the scenario analysis I'm, i need to understand in what environment and what i'm expected uh, to do uh then we will uh make um we call it a concept of use con use uh meaning how people are going to operate it what they will need uh, roughly yeah. mean, in, in a high level they, they will need a monitor here they'll probably need to uh to uh bring uh two gallons of, of water every day uh, and and maybe that's synonymous uh, with the concept of operations, like a conops. The concept of yeah, the con the conops. Um, in in military language, they they differentiate between conops and conuse. Conops is uh, what what do you use this equipment for, and in what scenario? And the conuse is how people are going to operate it in order to achieve the conops. Okay. Got it. So uh, it's just okay. this is my, this is my my perspective. Maybe it's not. Uh, maybe it's not a. Uh, 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 it's not really by the book. It's not, it's not a, a formal definition, but this is the, the greater idea. Yeah. Um, and then, and then at the SDR, the system, or the SRR, the system, uh, the system, uh, um, system design, system readiness, or or we call it system description uh, review. 
you will show people will show the, the basic architecture of the of the of the system and we will we will show um how how we think uh it's going to be operated what are the main challenges that we uh that we think are going to be and maybe uh if it's a physical uh or a, a physical uh, uh product maybe we will show um an artist's impression of the design of so what it will look like and then between sdr and pbr we will go deeper into the concept and we will try to 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 look at things uh um in in in, in much details and then we will come up with let's say a, re a real um uh procedures uh design we will show okay if you want to do this you will have to uh, push this button and you'll need to have uh, to go through this uh, these steps and then between the pre PDR the, um, preliminary, the design preliminary design review to the to the CDR to the critical design review this is where if I'm digital then the development the software development will go into the uh, sprints and we will deliver with the sprints we will deliver the UX design uh, to implement in the software and the mechanical team We'll start to do the detailed design of mechanical team and we'll start to confront the dilemmas of the design because they will not be okay we we needed a, a handle of 20 kilos uh, and it's not possible so now we need to look at something else and the ergonomists or the human factors engineers will have to help them to solve these dilemmas uh, along the way so this this is what they do between nice. pdr and cdr yeah so and it's we a conversation use, oh, it sounds like the whole time i mean between the engineering yeah. team and the All human the factors team all the time and, and, and it's a kind of an iterative way and we all the time use models and simulations uh it can be if it's digital we can build them in powerpoint or figma or Excure or just any other uh system that that you that we use but and and if it's physical we will build them from wood and from cardboard <laughs> uh, but also from machine part uh, or 3d printed part uh so depend depends on what the system is it makes sense it, like if you're getting probably trying to get a feel on like a lever that mimics a certain as uh, ergonomic sensation you probably right. need to use machine parts to achieve that to some extent if if, if it is if it is not something that i can calculate and i don't have the design guidelines for this because usually we know about the uh, human limitations um then then i'll have to design it sometimes you you'll have to use it uh, you you have to build it in order to uh, back get out people the design to try it also but get people to try this and sometimes you will just not get enough information from your CAD files or from your engineering uh, calculations and, and you need to try it I agree and, and sometimes you need to prove so you have uh, yeah, that and, makes and, a lot of sense. so you might Again, with just the lever example, because it seems like an easy one for me to conceptualize, you might have a lever and you're trying to figure out how hard should it be to pull this lever, but you don't really have you know, a torque spec in mind. Um, but maybe what you do to achieve that is you have plates on the side and a strain gauge, and then you have somebody pull it. Well, how did that feel? Uh, you know, it's kind of uh, a little bit too yeah, easy. No, it didn't feel deliberate. Bas basically, yeah. Yeah, basically, yeah. It, it's a simulation of, of an action, but yeah, we can simulate just anything up to... Uh, setting up a, a whole lab with um with vr uh with, with vr uh, goggles and uh and unity environment and we can simulate uh, a battle uh uh environment or an or or does that end up getting that... resold as a training tool at the end of the or is that just live for the uh, use study and then it because I feel like that would have Some, other uses. Like you could repackage that IP that you developed if you're going to all the trouble to do um, it. Right? Sim simulations for uh, for training are uh, developed differently okay. because uh, they need to be built once you have the final design. Ah, I see. And what we and what we do is we build it step by step. But it can be uh, the basis to understanding what you need at the end. Yeah. So it's it's, it's a bit it's a bit different use. We use it. We use it to to try different concepts, and training simulators uh, are uh, trying to simulate the, the the final design or the final yeah, product. And, and, and yeah, 
and they be and, and they should be, uh, fit um, better to reality. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So it's locked in at that point. It just it seems like so much work from a software perspective to build something like that. If you're going to use it and then throw it away, you know, when you change the design, but. I guess it's probably less work than the alternative in the cases you're describing. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, you know, uh, yeah. Luck, luckily, technology these days uh, is very developed. So, uh, simulate thing re with VR and with uh, I, I mentioned Unity, but I guess there are other platforms that uh, can help you simulate 3D environments. So there are people who are doing it very effectively and very uh, very fast and, and not very expensive. That's fair. Uh, I say this is so, a mechatronics uh, so, person, so I'm obviously biased here. Yeah, <laughs> but 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 as you, but as you said, uh, especially in in mechanics, the the cost of redesign or uh, or re, or redoing things is so high. But not not only in in money, but all, also in time. I mean, between one one cycle of design to another, there can be six months between. That's a and, good point. and you and so and, and and you don't want to go through these six months and at the end just after you machine the prototype and it costs you huge uh, amount of money to to realize that uh, it, it it just don't fit so <laughs> so, so you build so you build the model before and uh, you know when when I was when I was uh, in HP I I. In the beginning, I tried so hard to convince uh, my managers to build a, uh, a foam-based uh, nice. machine. Yeah, that's, that, that, we use that we, all we, the time. We, we just had the, um, the 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 basic architecture of the of the of the press, and I said, okay, let let's invest this um, two two thousand dollars in building a model, just just to simulate so that just that we get a feeling of how big this machine is. And I said, oh no, and it's tens of millions of dollars this this project and 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 it was very hard to convince people to to invest two thousand dollars at, at the end uh we did it uh we built we built this model uh, it was so useful nice it's one of the, be the the best returns on investment that you can invest in in a in a, in a complex project and and we made changes in the design uh because of things that we understood by simulating operations on this model yeah that's that's awesome. and, and from and and from that time on i mean you know I, there's hardly any project that i use that i don't use models or simulations and uh, as well as in digital i mean digitally it's very easy to uh, uh to simulate ux now i mean i, I we can bring uh even in, in the level of the concept you can already give somebody uh a model that they can try uh to 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 do actions on the on the design be it a, a mobile application or a, or, or or a c2 uh you know, you know command control uh system it's it's very easy to simulate yeah that, that makes a lot of sense and i guess probably the technology has progressed a lot uh since the last time that i sat down with um unity or unreal engine and I was a programmer like, long, long ago. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, uh, my undergraduate degree is actually in computer science, but I, I, it was a while ago, and so I haven't, I haven't really touched it since, if I'm being honest. And I, I've had a friend that was developing a video game, and it was an Unreal Engine, and I, I've had some friends doing mixed reality stuff, where you know it's pretty awesome. But I also saw how much effort they put in to get you know, a production mixed reality experience going for, for people that were doing it. And, you know, in some cases, millions of dollars. So I was thinking kind of in that scale, you know, and it sounds well, you like... Know, you know, you know that, that reminds me, you talked about uh, mixed reality and, and we talked about simulation. Uh, you know, you know how, how I know that I chose the, 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 the right uh, job, that I have the best job, that my kid's jealous of me. <laughs> that never say, happens. Well, well, they say, well, how do they take you to all these flight simulators? And you attend, uh, I, I attend surgeries sometime. And, nice. you, yeah, and, and you have this <laughs> VR and you and you go inside a tank. And say, how, yeah. how do I get to this job? So, so this is, I know, how I know that I, I chose the right job. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I um, I got to drive a very expensive robot at work the other day. That was a fun one. Um, I, I was at a client site looking at it, and you know, it it was just an interesting robot. And I, I said, hey, could I? Could I drive that by any chance? Like, I, I'd kick myself if I didn't at least ask. And they were like, oh, yeah, no problem. Here's the controls. <laughs> so I was very, very careful. Uh, it, was a, it was a three quarter of a million dollar robot. So I just drove it wow. forward about a foot and then backward about a foot. <laughs> <laughs> and very, very slowly articulated the sensor mast and some of the axes and then said, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's... Before, before I break anything. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. I didn't. I didn't want to be responsible for that, but I, I did want to yeah. get the chance to to give it a test drive. I also got to sit in a prototyped um, manned Dragon capsule when I was an intern at SpaceX before it was yeah. released to the public. So that was really fun. Yeah. And then I don't know. I mean, I, when you do a job like this, I guess you know museums kind of aren't as fun anymore, like a science museum, because you're seeing the new stuff. You know, every. <laughs> Or, or Every day at work. It's, 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 these are weird times that we that we we live in because basically t technology is no longer uh, um, uh, is no longer a challenge. I mean, I mean, uh, in, in, in terms yourself. of technology, <laughs> no, no. I mean, in terms of technology, you can you can do everything that you want. The only limitations mm -hmm. that you have now are money and and, and laws of nature. Like physics and uh, and, ke and chemistry. I mean, we haven't figured out okay, how to teleport we, we can... yet. <laughs> okay. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, so this is this is this isn't possible uh, physically. I mean, yeah, okay, fair uh, enough. Uh, so, so, so it's it, it's not it's just not possible, or, or we didn't discover it yet, but, uh, or, or we can or we cannot uh, drive in the light of speed yet. But but everything uh, everything else. I mean, if you look back 30 or 40 years ago which is not very long ago i mean i can remember things like this that, that we we couldn't even imagine a, a video call i mean we, we said yeah. wait maybe in the we future imagined it. i can... mean like 2001 a space odyssey was made in the 80s and they had video or jules verne or, or jules verne to uh 150 150 years ago yep but yep. um <laughs> but, but, but we could only imagine it and the technology wasn't there anymore it wasn't there yet but but now I don't think that um, there is something there, there is hardly something that is impossible technologically. I mean, it's only time of it's only a matter of of, of, of money and, and and time and effort that you want to invest. I don't know. I I, I if, can if not, respectfully if disagree breaking, here. <laughs> if you if you're not breaking the laws of physics, then. But the laws of physics get rewritten all the time. I mean, I'm not a physicist, but like we we discover stuff that that invalidates what we thought the laws of physics were, and and then new new shit comes to light, as they say in the Big Lebowski. Um, <laughs> and so, I feel like I don't know. I I always think back to that anecdote where they wanted to close the American Patent Office in the early 1900s because they thought everything had been invented, <laughs> and I feel like it's a dangerous mentality for me because. I don't yeah, know right. if I know anything right. from you, how long got, I've been alive. It's that I didn't, you know, the technology 10 years ago is nowhere near where it is now. And 10 years before that, it was nowhere near where we can't even imagine where it's going to be in 10 more years in terms of the engineering and the physics. Like, I, but you, it's but going to get better. Or it, or is, is it a question of, of technology or application? I, mean, I think it's both. It, or we, we're inventing uh, a like, new think about, like, photonics. for a, uh, oh, Sorry, yeah. I didn't mean to cut you off. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. Okay, but if it's application, though, I, I again, you you had you had a good point here, and I got caught up in a minuscule detail by saying I think the tech has more to develop. But you were saying, with the current tech, we still have a lot more to unlock in terms of applications and and making it work for people. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. No, I, mean, I, I mean, I mean, you can you can man <clears throat> you can manufacture almost everything that you imagine. Yeah. So. <laughs> so what do you see some of the new trends then that might come up and yeah, you know, I mean, this is dangerous. You don't have to engage if you don't want, but <laughs> you know, predicting, right? It's like you, nobody knows. I mean, we can we can take a best guess, but I guess what are some of the you know, trends and human factors that that seem to be kind of evolving or or something different or like what are some things that are sort of 
on the edge that you might start to see be adopted more and more. It seems like the VR XR is one of them where it's been a little bit overhyped, but we're getting to the realm of real uses. I'll, yeah, right. But I'll tell you, um, in terms of interaction, yes, VR and AR, uh, of course, are you know uh, pushing the the edge all the time. But uh, but as I said, these are applications in terms of um, human interaction or challenges in human interactions. There are, I think, two things uh, that are now um, we need we need to we need to understand how to uh, how to face and, and how to deal with. One is uh, AI, which is becoming more and more part of of, uh, of products and systems, and we have and, and there, there are big issues big questions there of in in one uh, in one term you, you is is it a decision support system or is it a system that takes decisions for you and when do you want the person to uh interfere or uh, uh or or get get or, or or do we still need men in the loop or or not or the other and the other one is robotics and autonomous systems, which is almost uh, one, kind of, one of yes, yes, and it, 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 these are just levels of uh, of autonomy. And and I heard one uh, researcher that I really appreciate uh, in, uh, in Israel, uh, Saft Gani. Now he works for General Motors. Uh, he said that autonomous uh, vehicles are one of the first environments where we will have people and robots in the same environment in the same uncontrolled environment <laughs> i mean we will have we'll have the, the the vehicles the robots and there will be there will still be pedestrians there and people who are uh working there that, that it's not like in a factory where you have robots um you know um uh running running through the the, the factory and and there are limits between uh, where people should be and where robots should be. And even in the collaborative the systems, you're highly instrumented in the environment where you've got exactly. you know, and, big and, and you give limitations systems. and you give limits uh, to the force of the robots that work and, and you know, to collaborate with robots. But on the street, you'll have the, the cars and you'll have the people who are crossing the road and, and, um, and the car will be the, the, the technology of the car or the autonomous system will be to be to be highly sophisticated uh, in order to deal with it, but in, in terms of human uh, of um, of human factors or human interaction, uh, there there's uh, there's uh, you know the, there there are the different uh, stages of uh, um, of of ADAS of, of autonomy. Of, <clears throat> so people say now that we we, we can go from. We're now at levels one or two where we have uh, assistive driving systems and we might not go through level three or, and four. We, we will jump right to uh, level five. Because, oh, interesting. Because, because in the middle, uh, uh, the, the mid levels are the car is fully autonomous, but in um, events of safety, you will need the intervention of a person. but they will not be uh, aware or they will not be ready for this. They will not be able to react on time. Them being so the operator, like the, the human. The operator has the yeah, e-stop available yeah. or whatever they're doing. Exactly. Not always an e-stop because, e because be, sometimes the car has inertia. Busy, uh, they will be busy sipping or reading a paper or, or talking to somebody because the car is autonomous. So yeah. so you, you will not be able, you might not be able to, to uh, to implement these uh, these levels in real life, I mean, they will be technologically they will they will exist, but in real life, it's it's a real challenge. So yeah. the the um, that's an interesting uh, way of looking at it. I never thought about it from that perspective. Because yeah. I I, so, so I have a lot of friends in the United. autonomous driving industry. Because mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't know how much you know about autonomous driving in Pittsburgh, but. We have we have quite a few companies working on it, and we just lost uh, Argo, uh, unfortunately. But um, yeah, no. Everybody always talks about the difficulty of navigating in the uncluttered environment, or the cluttered environment, I should say, the uncontrolled environment of 
you know, is that a trash bag or is that a baby on the road? Or, you know, is that right. somebody right. going to cross the street or somebody just standing by the street? Or, you know, what are all, there's a lot of things you have to think, or, you know, the woman that got killed when she was walking a bicycle because the classifier didn't realize if she was a woman or a bicycle, so it just ignored her. Right. And so, wow. um, yeah, it's a, it's a real thing that happened. And so, I guess um, I never and, thought and about the perspective. Statistically, statistically, they're probably safer than uh, a human driver. But humans are pretty good too. I'm I'm kind of quoting my friend Mike for Micah now, um, who he's uh, I think the managing director for Alpha Lab Gear, which is like the hardware branch of one of our local incubators. But, you know, I, I had him on the podcast and he was like, well, humans are better than people think, you know, than <laughs> the autonomous researchers are taught. But I right, like your perspective. Right. It reminds me of, you know, that story. And again, I'll probably get this wrong, but I think it was an Airbus that stalled out because people got a little bit too reliant on the autopilot and it was gaining altitude, I think. And then it just crashed into the ocean and, and nobody intervened, even though they could have. And so, I mean, that's. I'm sure I'm getting something wrong in that, but that that was recounted to me at one point, and I'm pro sorry, send all hate mail to podcast SK dot solutions. But you know, it, it's interesting because I never thought about that as a failure mode for you know L3 and L4 autonomous driving, which is you know the people just aren't going to be able to intervene because, and I, I never thought about even though I almost crashed, uh, you know. <laughs> I was driving a Tesla Model X in the Bay Area um, that one of my friends let me drive. And nobody told me as a user that it didn't have the ability to perceive roundabouts. And so wow. I, I was just allowing it to self-navigate toward a roundabout. And finally, my friend was like, catch it, man. You know? and I, <laughs> <laughs> I had to jump in and yeah, that, that, steer this thing around the roundabout so I didn't crash. That's exactly the point. Yeah. Yeah, because you know, I, I just didn't know. <laughs> I, had, I had no idea. So, yeah, yeah, you have you have to be you have to be ready. So, so you you have to be uh, in in a, in a position in a mental position where you know that you need to uh, to help the machine. Uh, when well, not everybody will be able to do it. So, uh, and and that that will make it uh, very dangerous if it happened. But uh, but I think that's that's why. Uh, fully autonomous uh, is more uh, 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 it's more probably to happen than L3 and L4. That's that's an but, interesting but way of looking at it. You might, no, you might be right. I mean, I, I kind of wonder what's going to push that breakthrough. I mean, that would seem to be technological to me. But I guess it's, I mean, it's, it's also, I mean, it's everything. It's human factors, it's engineering, it's data science. I mean, it's yeah, and, and there's the, the you know the even system. even with even, even with robots. I mean, we we worked with companies who develop robots for uh, warehouses, but also robots for uh, surgeries, and, and the world is going there. And and our sure. uh, and our challenge is to see what is the role of the person, and what do they need in order to perform this role. So. Um, the action or or what what the robot is doing will be will be safe will be efficient uh, uh yeah yeah no that's that's really cool yeah. and it seems like there's a few ways to do that one is to make the robot perfect and you know <laughs> totally self-sufficient and then i guess another one is user education so making sure the user understands the scope of the system and its limitations, like instead of calling it, you know, you know, autonomous driving or whatever, you know, call it, you know, like, you know, lane change assist or something. And, and maybe that helps with the user education. And then I guess other parts are just the actual, you know, I mean, I don't know, keeping the user engaged enough that they are still able to perform a supervisory role mm -hmm. in the system, you know, which, you know, easier said than done. <laughs> so. yeah. Yeah, that's 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 actually that's really good food for thought. I appreciate that. Yeah. So I feel like we might be nearing a good stopping point. Like it seems like we kind of have like a natural plateau. And if anybody's listened yeah. to us talk for this long, thank you. And uh, please subscribe <laughs> to Collaborative with Spencer Kraus on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. But uh, with that in mind, is there anything you want to plug or um, promote yourself on, on our way out? Um. I, I uh, watched the other day uh, 
a guy from NASA giving a lecture from a few years ago, uh, talking about um, why why the perspective of engineers is different from the perspective of a uh, human factors engineer or or a human system integration engineer, and they say, oh, well, when when engineers are doing their work, they're measured on how if how how will be the performance of the system or how costly will be the bomb of the of the of the system they're not measured on how costly will be the maintenance uh how how hard will be the training uh how will it fit the environment uh where it's where it's going to operate and so what what human factors engineering is doing and human system in integration in general is doing is first of all is to uh, make the system being able to be operated by by people by the persons I mean what we we didn't talk about it but in ergonomics there's not only the uh, the the aspect of usability or capability of doing things but there's also uh the aspect of danger because uh if if you you lift or, or you you have uh you have your there are some risk factors that can uh, you know result in an injury of, of the worker but so so we're, we're making uh safer equipment to use um we have um we we help uh, we we make uh, um, equipment that uh, people who operate it will make less mistakes, so the performance will be higher. Um, it will be uh, cheaper to maintain. It will be easier to maintain. Uh, Won't be so down for these as long. are yeah yeah downtime is something that yeah you, you really measure and um, so so all these aspects are aspects that are. You, you'll not you're not able to achieve if you're not taking into consideration the human factor uh because because at the end somebody's standing in front of the machine and they need to understand what they see they need uh to understand what they're doing they need to take the right decisions and they need to be able to do these things physically or cognitively be be able and and you know if people can get used and, and get trained to do almost every job even, even if it's a lousy uh, interface but you don't want a person um, to regret the day he was uh, he got the job that he's doing because it's, it's so frustrating to operate the machine <laughs> uh, so you want you want happy workers Yep. If, even 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 if it's not the uh, you know if, 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 even even if it's not a, a video game, it's 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 the machine that they operate because this this is their day job. It 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 can be easy. It can be fun. It can be. It shouldn't be a, a hassle to to do it. It shouldn't be hard to do it. It shouldn't be exhausting. It shouldn't be frustrating. Uh, so so this is what we're doing. We're we're helping. Um, the manufacturers or the designers to make their good products be excellent products in, in terms of how people will perceive them um and and, and this is a, a great satisfaction to, to doing what 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 we're doing excellent yeah that's that's beautiful <laughs> and i mean we've all used uh certainly systems that were poorly designed <laughs> rude the day <laughs> so, <laughs> You know, you're really doing great work, and and you know, I consider myself kind of grateful to have gotten to talk to you for this this amount of time. Yeah, so, it was very interesting, and uh, you know, um, it was very interesting for me, and, and I think uh, many uh, interesting uh, topics were raised here. So yeah, we could do it again too, and, and talk about more stuff. Yeah, great. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. And uh, do you want to say like the website for EDNU or anything before we cut it, or? Yeah, if 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 you want to check out our uh, website, it is www.ednu.net. Uh, you can find there uh, some information about the company and what we're doing, and some uh, uh, explanation about what Human Factors is. Yeah, and if you've got a project <laughs> like this and you want to bring in, you know, an awesome badass Human Factors firm. 
consider EDNU. <laughs> Great, thanks. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs>